So welcome, our peer webinar, Greenwashing or Real Climate Action, How to Tell the Difference. I am Mer Meitzelfeld, Institutional Giving Manager at PEER, and I'll be moderating today's event. This webinar is being hosted as part of Worldwide Climate and Justice Education Week, a project of Bard College Graduate Program in Sustainability, co-sponsored by the Open Society Network and Lever for Change, an affiliate of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. I see we have almost 50 people joining the webinar so far, so welcome everyone. We're excited that you're here. Um, just a quick note about volume and subtitles. You can adjust the volume in Zoom by clicking the arrow on the micro microphone icon at the bottom of your screen. Use the slider to increase output level volume. You can also show subtitles by clicking on the show captions button. Next slide, please. PEER appreciates the opportunity to host this webinar. For those of you who don't know about PEER or Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, we are a unique nonprofit organization that represents government whistleblowers on environmental and public health issues and also works with current and former public employees to address some of the most important issues of our time, from climate change to the biodiversity crisis to toxic pollution in our environment. Before we dig into today's topic, we'd like to learn a bit more about who's attending this webinar. So please take a moment to respond to our introduction poll question. What is your profession? All right, while these numbers are being tallied, I'd like to explain a bit about our topic, greenwashing or real climate action, how to tell the difference. Next slide, please. Greenwashing, loosely defined, is a form of advertising or marketing by a company, a government, or a government agency, a nonprofit, or even a university to make the public believe that it is doing more to protect the environment than it really is. The problem with greenwashing is that it promotes false solutions to the climate crisis and distracts from more credible actions. Because there is so much money going to climate programs and so many climate marketing claims and false solutions being thrown around. We thought it would be useful to have this discussion and we are delighted to present this information as part of BARD's Worldwide Climate Justice and Education Week. There's so much for all of us to learn. As this is such a complicated and controversial subject, our program is designed to ensure maximum discussion from our panelists and our audience. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions throughout the webinar and click the thumbs up to upvote questions you are particularly interested in. We will not be monitoring the chat for questions, but rather submit your questions through the Q&A. We will be asking polling questions throughout the event. So let's get started. Before I introduce today's agenda and speakers, let's look at the introduction poll results to see who we have joining today's webinar. All right, so it looks like we have a good mix joining us. We have some in academia, government, students, nonprofit, advocacy, conservation, and other business. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. So next slide, please. We will start off the agenda with a climate quiz, then discuss questions for the audience and panelists before jumping into short presentations. Our speakers today will be Tim Whitehouse, Peer's Executive Director, Lori Williams, a retired attorney with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and Peer Consultant, Sanaya Manuel, Climate Policy Analyst with Progressive Maryland, and Kyla Bennett, Peer's Science Policy Director and Director of Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Programs. Tim will focus his discussion on renewable energy claims made through the use of renewable energy credits, or RECs. Lori will talk about problems with the carbon offsets market in California and elsewhere. Sanai will describe a grassroots initiative to fight trash incinerators in Maryland. And Kyla will discuss greenwashing within the agriculture industry and ways we as consumers can make more climate friendly choices. Unless we're falling way behind on time, there will be an opportunity for one or two follow up questions after each presentation. We wanna keep this as interactive as possible. 
We will cover a lot of topics today. If you'd like more information, you can contact me or the speakers. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website and shared via email after the webinar. Next slide. So I'd like to start off with a five question quiz to test our climate literacy. So let's pull up the climate quiz, please. All right, so first question. To avoid severe impacts of climate change, the Paris Climate Agreement set a targeted limit for average global temperature increases. What is that limit? Is it 1.3 degrees Celsius, 1.5, 1.8, or 2.0? Give everyone a minute to respond. All right. And we can show the correct answer is 1.5 degrees. And we are bumping up against that threshold, as you may know, especially within the past 12 months. All right, next question. About how many tons of carbon dioxide emissions do we need to reduce annually to meet the Paris Climate Agreement goal? Is it 500 million tons, 2 billion tons, or 5 billion tons, approximately? Right, one submitting their answers and we can show the correct answer. All right, the correct answer is about 2 billion tons of reductions we need annually. And this is on the scale of what we saw during the coronavirus pandemic slowdown. So big, big reductions indeed. All right, next question. 2023, was the hottest year on record since 1850, true or false? All right, we can show the correct answer. Correct answer is true. So this just underscores that we do need a lot of action on climate. All right, next question. The U.S. climate goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions how much by 2030? Is it by a quarter, by a half, or by three quarters? All right, let's show the correct answer. All right, and the correct answer is one half. That's the goal. All right, last question. By 2022, both solar and wind energy had become cost competitive with fossil fuels, even without government subsidies. Is this true or false? All right, we can show the correct answer. All right, the correct answer is true. So this is very encouraging news. And it is predicted that wind and solar will continue to outpace fossil fuels and lead to great cost savings in the future. Excellent. All right. So as a global community, we are facing a critical decade of climate action that is needed to rapidly decrease greenhouse gas emissions. So let's get into our discussion questions for the audience and panel. Can we... Um, Pull down the slots, please. And get the uh, panelists to turn on their cameras. So I'm gonna ask the audience this question first. What do you think are the three most important climate solutions we should be focusing on? And you can just type your answer in there. So panelists, please take a moment to think about this question while the audience is giving their answers. All 
Right. Tim, do you want to kick us off with this panel discussion? Sure. What are the three most important climate solutions we should be focusing on? So uh, thank you, Murr. For me, I think they are reducing energy consumption, developing distributed energy systems. These are small scale energy systems such as community solar and battery storage and protecting intact ecosystems. These won't solve the climate crisis, but we need not lose sight of them. Great. Those are some very key aspects of addressing climate change. Lori, uh, what about you? What do you think about this? Well, uh, recognizing the importance of things Tim brought up, I'd say it's rapidly transitioning away from fossil fuel energy, a rapid scale up of clean energy and energy efficiency, which Tim mentioned, and also to get there, passing US climate legislation that will incentivize and accelerate these changes. Great. Yes, I definitely think all those things are important and definitely the legislation piece as well. Sanai, what do you think about this? Yeah, said uh, I want to highlight as well. Um, but for me, the three most important uh, solutions are, first and foremost, we need to have a whole of society clean energy transition, but in doing so without leaving anybody behind, right? So this transition is going to cost us some money. Uh, and so existing inequalities are going to show up unless they are addressed. Additionally, we're going to need to reimagine and fortify our food and water systems to be able to adapt to and to mitigate climate change. And then lastly, we need to work on community education. We need to work on community awareness and empowerment to be able to tackle and, and take action regarding climate change and environmental justice that people are, are being impacted by. Hey, thanks so much. Very, very important perspective. All right, Kyla, the, this question goes to you now. Well, what do you think are the most important solutions we should be focusing on? Sure. I think one of the most important things we can do, and hopefully others will agree with me after I finished my part of the presentation, is drastically reducing consumption of animal products, meat and dairy, if not eliminating them. Also reducing consumption of stuff. Like, do you really need that thing you just ordered from Amazon? Because every time someone buys something, it is has greenhouse gas emissions. And the third and final thing is rewilding lands that can be rewilded, hopefully lands that will no longer be in animal agriculture. Great, thanks so much. Um, very important, all of these things are very important parts of climate solutions. So can we take a look at what the audience responded to for, for their answers? All right. Very good. And we hope that you will all be thinking more about these issues critically and about things that we can all do, um, either personal choices we can make or policy actions that we can ask our governments to take. So thanks, thanks all for sharing these insights. Um, the next question we have is for the panelists. And this is getting to uh, the topic of our discussion today. How do you spot false climate solutions and what do you look for? Tim, do you want to start us off again? You're on mute. Thanks, Murr. Uh, for me, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. So um, I just want to urge people not to rely on the headlines, press releases, and talking points of the various stakeholders and interested parties. Um, and so it's very difficult to identify what greenwashing is, and knowledge is necessary. Thank you. Great, excellent. Uh, what about you, Lori? Right. Well, I agree with Tim. It can be difficult to distinguish. It can be complex. But first I ask, does this climate solution help us rapidly transition away from burning fossil fuels? Does this climate solution help us accelerate a rapid scale up of clean energy and energy efficiency? And if not, at a minimum, you wanna be a bit skeptical 
you want to read further, you want to check with trusted sources. These are my thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. Snai? Yeah, uh, for me, it's a false solution is a proposed solution that really does nothing to address or eliminate the, the source of the problem, you know, and I consider it like a band-aid solution. For example, waste to energy or burning trash for energy, you know, they claim that they are the alternative to landfilling despite, you know, requiring landfilling to dispose toxic waste at. Waste energy also claims that they're burning trash is the solution on how to deal with our waste, uh, rather than what is the, the way in which we do, deal with our waste is reducing, reusing, recycling, and so on. And then lastly, waste energy claims that they're invigorating the local community by sponsoring cleanups and providing jobs, but they're doing so all while releasing chemicals and pollutants that are poisoning the community that they are claiming to have helped. Gotcha. Yes, very interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that in your presentation. Kyla, do you want to uh, end off the panel discussion and talk to us sure. about how you spot false solutions? Sure. For me, um, if a solution is offered that makes people think that their lives are going to be just the same as they are today, um, I think that's going to be a false solution. We are all going to have to compromise and give some things up. Um, there's just no doubt about it. Given where we are with global uh, warming right now and how much uh, carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, we're going to have to make some changes, and some of them will not be comfortable changes. So that's one. The second one are those easy tech fixes, like let's shield the sun um, and prevent sun from heating the planet, or let's put up a a curtain to keep the glaciers from melting, those things are not going to work and it's not worth putting the money into. We know what the answer is. We just have to implement it. And finally, um, I look for things where there's one problematic thing substituted for another problematic thing. And one of those that I'm going to be talking about today is like grass-fed beef. Um, instead of just eating beef, eat grass-fed beef. That's not a solution. And I'll explain why. So you have to be really careful of those equivalent, false equivalencies. Great, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to hearing more, many more details in all of your presentations, starting with Tim. So could, thank you panelists, and could we please pull the slides back up to slide six? All right, so Tim Whitehouse is Peer's executive director. His interest is in the intersection of science policy and the civil service. Prior to joining Peer, Tim was an attorney at the, C at the US Environmental Protection Agency and was head of law and policy program at the North American Commission for Environmental Cooperation in Montreal, Canada. He has worked as a consultant for companies on environmental compliance issues and with nonprofit organizations focusing on clean energy issues. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Mer. It's good to be here. Uh, it's great to be here talking about these important issues. Uh, next slide. So I am going to be speaking on misleading clean electricity claims and specifically the role of renewable energy credits or RECs in these claims. Before we get started, let's do a poll on whether you know what a REC is. All right. While this poll is going on, I'll be uh, continuing with my presentation. We'll leave the poll open for about a minute. Um, and I'll talk briefly about what RECs are, why they are important, how they can be used to make false energy claims, why this matters, and what you can do to address this issue. Next slide. So I'm going to move very quickly through these slides. The purpose of this presentation is to give a very brief overview of a very complicated uh, question. So let's start with this. RECs are good. Renewable energy credits are good. We need them. Uh, this illustration shows how all energy feeds into the grid the electrons are all mixed up. Entities buy RECs to claim the environmental attributes from the renewable electricity being produced and put into the grid. So why don't we go to the next slide? Why don't we see our poll results? All right, so it's kind of what I expected. It's about a third each, and there's about 2% of the people, one person with a sense of humor. So. Um, good. I will say um, there are many different views on RECs, and what I'm doing is sharing uh, my views from working on this issue for a no number of years. So um, let's dig in. So renewable energy credits 
are certificates that represent their electronic certificates. They represent one megawatt hour of electricity produced. They're used to verify renewable electricity claims, and they are tradable market-based instruments. People that buy these can trade them throughout the country. They can arbitrage them even. People often ask, what is one megawatt hour of electricity? What can that do? Well, it can power an average American home for 1.2 months. You can drive an electric car for about 3,600 miles. And I found on the internet, so it must be true, you can toast 89,000 slices of bread. And remember the toasted bread issue. We're gonna to return to that in the last slide. So why are RECs important? RECs allow electricity providers, government agencies, companies, or individuals that retire these RECs, they stop using them, as I said, to claim the environmental attributes of that electricity using those RECs. And so there's RECs that serve the voluntary market and the compliance market. And this is an important distinction. So a voluntary market is when a company or person chooses to buy renewable electricity, but are not required to do so by law. For example, in many states, consumers can choose to buy green electricity from their utilities. In addition, many companies are striving to reach ambitious clean electricity goals. These consumers or companies are buying regular energy from the grid, perhaps mostly made up of fossil fuels, and then they're buying the renewable energy credits to claim the environmental attributes from renewable energy sources. It's pretty complicated. A compliance market is when the electricity providers are required by law to meet renewable electricity or energy claims. RECs form the basis of these claims. For example, in Maryland, Maryland has a goal to achieve 50% renewable electricity by 2030. Many other states have renewable energy goals. These goals have to be met under the law, they're required. In most of these states, electricity providers have to buy RECs or pay a penalty to show they are meeting the renewable electricity requirements. That's a lot to digest. Let's move on to the next slide. All right, so RECs were invented in the 1990s to stimulate renewable electricity markets. The big question is why do these things even exist? Well, we need to track renewable electricity. They would allow energy providers and purchasers to continue buying electricity from fossil fuels, but subsidize the development of new renewable energy by buying RECs from facilities that produced that renewable electricity. The idea was that renewable energy producers could sell certificates to offset certificates that represented the greenness of their energy they made. Anyone buying those certificates or RECs could claim that green power. This was important because at the time, these types of subsidies were important because the theory was the money going from the sale of these RECs would stimulate more clean, clean energy production. And renewable energy was more expensive at that time. It's important to note that RECs can be bundled or unbundled. Again, this is pretty wonky. An unbundled REC is when renewable electricity facilities like a wind farm sell RECs and electricity separately. As I mentioned, whoever buys the RECs and retires them can claim the environmental attributes of that wind energy. With unbundled RECs, you can still be buying the electricity produced from coal and natural gas. Bundled RECs mean the entity is buying the wind energy in the REC together from the wind farm and then retiring the RECs. This is good. The energy the entity is buying is in fact green. Next slide, please. So this system is pretty confusing and complicated and open to abuse. Um, a lot of uh, clean energy and clean electricity goals are based on the buying and selling of RECs. RECs, as I mentioned, are even arbitraged. The problem is because this system is so poorly regulated in most parts of the country, RECs are one of the easiest and cheapest ways for companies to appear more green than they actually are. Here are some articles that identify some of the problems with RECs. These are very prestigious and reputable news organizations. All of these articles you can find on the internet. Essentially, they all say the system is generally, and I say generally, not working. 
either because the systems of buying and selling RECs are not stimulating new clean energy production as anticipated, or they're actually supporting dirty energy sources that have been classified under law as green, such as incineration or biomass burning of wood. And they allow, in some instances, the price gouging in states that have poorly regulated markets or deregulated. So this, the problem is this uh, costs consumers real money. Ultimately, it's the consumers that pay for these wrecks. Next slide, please. Remember, wrecks are not bad. It's how we use them. So how can they be used to make false claims? I think I've touched on a few of these. The problems vary by state and region. Generally, false claims exist because of the lack of regulatory oversight, the lack of meaningful and consistent definitions of what renewable energy actually is, for example, burning trash and wood, and many states allow this as renewable energy and allow those uh, facilities to sell renewable energy credits to make more money. And there's growing evidence that many, but not all rec programs do not support new clean energy production as intended. There are a number of uh, reasons for this and they're very complicated and not really well understood, but they are being better understood. One thing is a lot of the facilities that are selling recs are old. They're from 2008, from 2000, you know, from before these renewable standards were set. And so these facilities are already paid for. They don't need the subsidies that RECs provide. The money is icing on the cake, and there's no requirements that these companies actually reinvest that money into renewable energy sources. I would all, I'd like to say one thing, though. Uh, solar uh, actually, in some instances, is much more expensive than other energy sources, particularly the small and mid-scale solar farms, and those do need subsidies, and RECs are one way that those can be subsidized. Offshore wind uh, is very expensive and will need subsidies. Geothermal also. So we will need a subsidy programs for many clean energy sources, and RECs can help provide that. Next slide. So how big is this problem? This is a huge problem. We don't know how big it is. And for the academics on this, it would be a great uh, area to look into. In Maryland, I personally believe this is a huge problem and that by our calculations, uh, U.S. Uh, Maryland consumers will pay almost a billion dollars for RECs between 2008 and 2030 that are very dubious as to whether they are producing, helping to stimulate new clean energy production. Uh, so, and as I mentioned, those costs are passed on to the consumer. So next slide. So why does this matter? I think time is short. We need to focus our money on things that work and the consumer is paying and we should never be complacent. Next slide. So there's a lot here and I'll try not to go through it in too much detail, but um, what can we do to help address this problem? One is get to know where your electricity comes from and where your recs come from to help make better choices and to help fight for good policies in your states. Ultimately, for RECs to work, there needs to be a unified REC markets, and right now they're not. They vary state by state. And um, I provided some bullets here on laws uh, and how those can help stimulate using the REC markets, um, you know, new clean energy sources. Uh, one of those is don't allow old facilities to sell RECs. And we need much more transparency in the REC markets. People do not really know what's being bought and sold. Uh, keep renewable energy clean is key. We need to focus on solar, wind, and geothermal and things like that. Um, we need to make sure that RECs sources need the revenues before they, they're getting you know, money from RECs. And we really need to support real clean energy solutions like community solar and energy conservation. And so I want to go back to the toast. So maybe at least a few people have a sense of humor. Maybe you understand it. Maybe you don't. But uh, so for the toast, for your toaster, use grid electricity, even if it's fossil fuel for your toast. Uh, aluminum foil has a big carbon footprint. So, um, but anyways, to answer the question I asked in the beginning, are RECs effective to achieve renewable electricity goals? They can be if used careful in carefully regulated markets designed to achieve new clean energy production. 
But from my observation, most programs are not effective, and this is costing consumers a lot of money that could be spent on better programs. Unfortunately, they're too often used for greenwashing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. So I think we have about a minute or so for a question. So uh, we're going to take a, a question from the audience. This is from Mira. So what happens when the producer of renewable energy experiences disaster, for example, a wildfire that impedes their ability to produce renewable energy? Do the, do the certificates they produce mark energy already produced, or can they also represent energy that is to be produced later? If it's the latter, then does it, doesn't it mean anything when the producer experiences setbacks or disasters? So um, RECs represent energy produced. Um, and so if someone's facility is uh, destroyed, they can no longer sell RECs because they're not producing energy. There are certain situations where uh, energy producers can sell forward contracts on RECs. And then I guess it would depend on what the contract says, but the RECs are designed for uh, energy produced, electricity produced. All right, great. Thanks so much, Tim. And for sake of time, we need to move along to our next speaker, Lori. Lori Williams is an environmental consultant with PEER. She recently retired after 15 years as an attorney at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Lori and her husband, Alan Zabel, also formerly with EPA, have written and spoken on climate policy. Her goals are to apply the skills she learned at EPA to address the climate crisis, collaborate with others to draft principles for model national climate legislation, and help build public support for effective and fair climate legislation. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Mur. Hi, all. So um, my goal today is to briefly explain what carbon offsets are and the reasons they are harmful to our efforts to solve the climate crisis. I will also discuss effective alternatives. The problems with carbon offsets could be a two semester class. So today I'll just touch on a few key points. Next slide. As awareness of the climate crisis has grown, so too has the use of carbon offsets in federal, state, and voluntary programs. Despite extensive evidence that carbon offsets lack integrity, offsetting and carbon markets are still being developed as a key mechanism in international climate negotiations of the Paris Accords. Next slide. An example of uh, this type of mechanism is the California cap and trade climate program, which allows carbon offsets to be about half of required reductions needed to meet the cap California has imposed on industrial sources. Next slide. This chart from the World Resources Institute helps explain how carbon offsets are supposed to work in relation to a cap on emissions. On the left, you have a system without offsets. The yellow column represents industrial emissions has a and has a black portion at the top. This represents required emission reductions from that sector in order to reach the goal or cap shown as a red line. On the right, you have a system with offsets. Instead of requiring emission reductions, this facilities are allowed to purchase offsets in the uncapped sectors shown in green, like agriculture and forestry and rely on alleged equivalent reductions in these sectors. Next slide. In this slide, you see a third set of bars on the right. This shows what happens when additional carbon reductions do not actually occur in the uncapped sectors as a result of the offset program. Emissions continue unabated in the industrial sector, and there is no corresponding reduction or sequestration in the uncapped sectors. Of course, given the climate, crisis, what we really need is not reductions in one sector or the other. We need reductions in both. Next slide. In this presentation, I'll briefly explain five reasons carbon offsets don't work, including lack of additionality, demand shifting, lack of permanence, perverse incentives, and harm to other climate tools. Next slide. 
The additionality of carbon offsets is defined as ensuring that reductions in greenhouse gas emissions are both beyond what is legally required and beyond what would otherwise occur without the offset payment incentive. California and other jurisdictions have written protocols for carbon offsets that claim to meet this standard, but careful examination of the protocols show they allow offsets for a wide range of activities that are merely business as usual. Given this leeway in the protocols, there is no enforceable standard for true additionality. And as all of us know, if a limit isn't enforceable and enforced, it isn't effective. Next slide. An easy to understand example is California's program to grant offsets for preservation of allegedly threatened forests. The alleged threat is a story a project developer tells and a verifier paid by the developer verifies. However, since many forests are preserved for other reasons, the alleged forest offset may just be a payment for what someone was already planning to do. A carbon offset video by John Oliver in his Last Week Tonight series provides real world examples of this flaw. Next slide. A second example of non-additional offsets counted by California is the use of methane digesters on dairy farms. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has found, uh, prior slide, yeah, <laughs> thank you. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has found that capture of methane from manure at large farms was already profitable due to the use or sale of methane without an offset payment. Digesters also help factory farms avoid paying penalties for violating regulations that prohibit the release of manure contaminated runoff and damages for harming neighboring properties. Next slide. A second problem with offsets is demand shifting. You may preserve a forest in one location, but demand for wood is global, so a different forest will be cut. Next slide. A third problem with offsets is lack of permanence. Even if you commit to preserving a forest, it may burn. And as you know, a warming climate increases the chance of wildfire. Next slide. A fourth problem is the perverse incentive to keep polluting activities legal. A famous example is Europe's approval of offsets for the destruction of HFC-23, a powerful greenhouse gas that is a byproduct of manufacturing refrigerants. While releasing HFC-23 was already prohibited in Europe, Europe's protocol allowed offsets for the destruction of HFC-23 in China where release was not prohibited. The release was a huge, the result was a huge perverse financial incentive to increase production of the gas and to delay appropriate regulation and enforcement in China. Next slide. Another example of a perverse incentive is the California program providing offsets for destroying coal mine methane. This offset makes coal mines more profitable when release of coal mine methane could and should be regulated. And here again, allowing offsets for destruction increases industry's incentive to fight to delay appropriate regulation. Next slide. The last carbon offset flaw I'll review today is their poison pill impact on our other climate tools. We have four main categories of climate tools, economic incentives, regulation, public spending, and international agreements. Offsets keep the price of emitting greenhouse gases low and volatile. This reduces the economic incentive for what we need most, a rapid transition away from burning fossil fuels. Offsets also increase the incentive to keep polluting activities legal, delaying appropriate regulation. And because offsets undermine the incentive for clean energy transition, they increase our need for public spending to achieve these same results. An example is the cost of electric vehicle tax credits. Finally, if US policies continue to support offset programs, we will continue to spread this ineffective mechanism into our international agreements. Next slide. In contrast, I believe that if we collectively could take a deep breath and build political will, we could enact fair and effective mechanisms needed to solve the climate crisis. Gradually increasing carbon fees on fossil fuels where they enter our economy 
would be an enforceable mechanism that could incentivize a rapid shift away from fossil fuels. Pairing this with a monthly per person rebate would help to keep energy affordable for everyone during the transition. Carbon fees would not create a perverse incentive to avoid appropriate regulation, and the financial incentives to shift to clean energy would free up public investment for critical climate projects that a carbon price cannot reach, such as improving public transportation and our electrical grid. And finally, if we go with carbon fees as opposed to carbon offsets, the U.S. would provide a positive model for fair and effective climate policies in our international agreements. Next slide. Happy to answer any questions, and thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. I've definitely learned a lot from the examples you provided. Uh, we have time for one question before we need to move on. So this question is from Mary. If I'm going to take a plane trip, is there any carbon offset program you think is a valid way to offset my plane trip? I'm sorry, but no, I don't think there is a carbon offset program that's working. That is a net positive. Um, you know, I understand that we all feel a lot of guilt about flying, and I think that's a reasonable response. And I think just, a, you know, making a commitment to uh, learn more about this, to talk to others and join organizations that you think are moving in a positive direction is probably the best thing you can do to uh, allay your guilt about your trip. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Lori. So we're going to move on to our next presenter, Sanai. So Sanai Emanuel is a climate policy analyst with Progressive Maryland, where he empowers communities across the state to take action on environmental and climate justice issues. His background is in research and advocacy surrounding environmental policy on issues ranging from domestic and global climate change and food and agriculture policy to ensuring and defending equitable access to a healthy environment for all. Welcome, Sanai. Thanks, Mara. Hi, everybody. My name is Sanai. Um, I live in Capitol Heights, Maryland. Today, I have the privilege to discuss with you all how uh, Progressive Maryland's Environmental Justice Task Force, which is a coalition of Community members in the neighborhoods surrounding Baltimore's trash incinerator work together in partnership with organizations across Maryland to stand up, you know, to stand up for their communities and fight against greenwashing uh, from waste to energy facilities, also known as trash incineration. So these incinerators emit significant amounts of greenhouse gas and air pollution, which contribute to health harms in overburdened neighborhoods. Let's go to the next slide. So let's start there. Why are these neighborhoods overburdened? Well. There are many uh, polluters, you know, one of which being the incinerator, that emit toxic pollutants like mercury, lead, nitrogen oxides, among many others that harm people's health significantly. And the Baltimore incinerator, which is located in the Westport neighborhood, subjects the surrounding community to over $55 million in health damages per year and contributes to disproportionately high rates of asthma and cancer. You can go to the next slide. And not only is there a significant human impact, there's a significant climate impact. As the single largest stationary source of CO2 emissions in the city of Baltimore is the incinerator. And a study in um, PLOS Climate found that waste energy emits more greenhouse gases than any other source of power, double that of coal. And each year, the Baltimore trash incinerator produces the equivalent CO2 emissions of over 150,000 cars. To try to get a sense of the the scale. The next slide. So these are the these are the facts, right? And, and, and this this is data coming from the EPA itself. But the incinerator industry really works over time to try to cover up their pollution, to confuse the public, or to create fear through their narratives. And publicly, the Baltimore incinerator is you know you know releases and touts these reports that bring up really common industry talking greenwash talking points. You know they talk about that. Burning trash in Baltimore prevents the emissions um, by preventing miles driven to the nearest landfill, but they don't tell you that the nearest landfill is just a couple miles down the street. And they also talk about uh, without the facility, the city is going to need to utilize fossil fuels to deal with its energy demand and its waste management needs. And these are all false. We can go to the next slide. They're also touting, you know, a perceived superiority of our landfilling. And it's, I think it's important to note that 
Um, although there's a quote here from French scientists saying that uh, you know waste energy is a better alternative to landfilling. Right? The EPA is currently reviewing its waste management hierarchy to review whether that's even a true statement. In addition to the Baltimore incinerator, the Covanta company, which runs the other incinerator in Maryland, reiterates and replays these same greenwashing narratives on their website. So we're going to go to the next slide. So that's in addition to those reports, right, the incinerator industry also touts all the great things that they're doing for the community to make up for the fact that, you know, their pollution are harming these very communities. To add insult to injury, the $750,000 that they put towards these initiatives are subsidized by those very same communities that they're polluting and harming. And additionally, they dispatch individuals who attended our community meetings to create fear about what the city will do if the incinerator isn't there to deal with its trash problem. And then the man on the top right is an example of one of those people who'd come to our community event to try to dissuade community members from taking action. In the next slide. So this is what's really been said publicly and what's available easily publicly, but there's a lot that's shared uh, not you know, behind the scenes and the waste energy, trash generation industry engaged in really serious behind the scenes greenwashing, primarily through its uh, lobbying efforts in the Maryland state legislature. They reuse these same narratives that they use on the public regarding what to do with the trash. You know, they harp on fears surrounding uh, grid capacity, electrical grid capacity, that without them, there's going to be a loss of electricity produced by the incinerators. You know, they, they threaten the elected officials that they're going to lose jobs and that their community engagement will end. And they continue to fight to receive the renewable energy credits that Tim mentioned, which is where our main battle with um, uh, trash incineration lies. An image uh, on the right of the screen shows which states accept this greenwashing and, and publicly subsidize burning trash for energy in red. And I'll explain how that subsidy works in the next few slides. So in the next slide. So understanding that most of our battle really takes place on the policy arena. You know, what is the policy problem? Well, Maryland utility ratepayers have sent the Baltimore trash incinerator excess of $66 million through our Straits Renewable Portfolio Standard Program, also known as RPS, which is, like Tim said, supposed to develop and support clean renewable energy like solar, wind, and geothermal. But unfortunately, and, and even a peer report shows that something like a fourth of Maryland's energy sources that are being subsidized as clean renewable are, are false solutions, uh, trash incineration, biomass, and biogas included. We go to the next slide. So what's the policy solution? Now, I wanna say that this is an incomplete policy solution, right? Not all that's being greenwashed in our state is being addressed, but this would be a start, right? Removing burning trash as an eligible source to receive utility rate payer funds is a way to combat greenwashing. So but the, this is how twisted things are here. That, you know, I, as a Marylander, um, in each of my utility bills, uh, sending a little bit of money to an incinerator that's not even in my state, that's in Virginia, that is polluting the air in the Washington, D.C. region. So the Reclaim Renewable Energy Act, which was introduced this year, with, which is legislation that we supported with a coalition of other groups, would have ended that subsidy. In the next slide. And what we got to do, uh, not ourselves, but rather the communities we were, which we're working with, have been able to reimagine their future and redefine it. And they have said that their future is one where their communities don't have to struggle to live and breathe due to the old systems remaining in place. The community has defined clean energy publicly in their testimony, uh, solar panels, wind powers, and heat pumps, and they exclude burning trash from their definition of renewable. You can go to the next slide. So they did that. But how did we get to that point? How did we work together to combat greenwashing and press Baltimore City forward on its clean energy transition? So firstly, we really started by engaging in community development, which started by listening. And then we moved into informing and then ultimately developing people. We started off by knocking on thousands of doors and listened to community concerns about air pollution. And then we were able to connect these concerns to a policy solution and then informed community members in ways that they could understand. And then we continue to educate our, ourselves on this issue and how we can push for change. We took webinars, we learned about community composting, and then we did so while developing leaders that we met at their doors. You can go to the next slide. Once we educated and prepared ourselves, we then activated ourselves together with religious, um, educational, labor, environmental, and community groups 
to, to take action on, on the issues we were seeing and to push for the true solutions that we have defined. And they testify to the human impact that the incinerator has on them, on their families, their communities, and that they truly wanna see clean energy subsidized in their neighborhoods. Um, you know, we, we work to engage in a communication campaign with the support of local journalists, highlighting the lives of community members and how they've been able to push back against greenwashing from trash incineration. And we held public events to spread awareness and to allow them to testify uh, and to share their, their stories. The elected officials who had our backs welcomed us warmly to Annapolis as we testified there. And then the ones who didn't really feared our presence. So you can go to the next slide. So before I conclude, um, I just really want to highlight two things that I'm really proud about that our coalition was able to achieve. The first is a win that we were able to include in our state's climate plan, um, you know, sent to the governor that we, that there's an explicit policy recommendation that removes trash incineration from the RPS. Um, again, this is just the beginning, and this is just on trash incineration. We have a whole host of other greenwashing issues we have to deal with in Maryland, but we were able to get one explicitly on uh, an important document. And then the second is a collaboration with PEER that we were able to engage in to create a report that really highlighted this issue. And we were able to demonstrate that not only are the subsidies on trash incineration in Maryland increasing rapidly, 700%, but they haven't been met with any increase in electricity production. And in the case of Baltimore, that 700% increase was met with a 35% decrease in electricity. Unfortunately, these are arguments that we have to make um, separate to the whole fact that greenwashing is happening. But unfortunately, these are how we've had to battle in the, the state's General Assembly. So, you know, these wins have bolstered our campaign and we're going to continue to empower communities to fight false solutions. Uh, and the, the, we're just beginning. So, I believe that's my last slide, um, a, a, other than my concluding slide. But yeah, I'm really happy to connect with you all, answer any questions, and thanks for allowing me to present on what the work we've been doing. Great, thank you so much, Sanaim. Uh, we have time for one question and then we'll just have to quickly move on, but we should have plenty of time at the end for um, getting to all these other questions. Mm -hmm. So this question is from Shandu. So neither, it seems like neither incinerators or landfills are really solutions. Isn't the future a way of living zero waste lives? So how do we get there quickly? And uh, what are other green ways that we can generate energy and manage waste? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I agree. I think one of the things that we've been able to do on the question of zero waste is elevate community solutions to zero waste. Um, we've been able to work with community composters, and we hope to work with them in the, in the future to be able to uplift and support the work they're doing where they're actively trying to starve the incinerator, right? I think when I think about combating greenwashing, I see it as a multiple-headed snake. There are multiple... Uh, things that need to be done to be able to push for and achieve the future that we want to see. And so that's all part of it. Um, and, and we're trying to create a comprehensive solution package that doesn't just look at the, what do you do with energy, but what do you do with um, you, you know, a, a waste management system um, and, and continuously encouraging the city officials to, to move away. I think there's been some great work done by some organizations we, we work closely with on bringing a um, composting facility to the city of Baltimore, right? There, there wasn't one in the city. And now through EPA funding, they're going to be building one. So we're, we're, it's an ongoing process to push the city towards zero waste. Um, but it, 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 there's a lot of things that have to happen and, and we can't do it alone. So we work with other organizations that are a little more um, better equipped to answer those questions and provide guidance on zero waste. But that's an official, you know, we, we had webinars on composting, how to compost in your own uh, in your own home. So that's part of the, that is that is the solution. Um, but there's a lot of solutions we're gonna have to, to educate and, and empower people to adopt. Great, thanks so much, Sanai. Um, so now we're gonna move on to our next presenter, Kyla Bennett. Kyla is Peer's Director of Science Policy, as well as our Director of Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Programs. Kyla previously worked at the US EPA and first became involved with Peer in the mid-1990s when she became a whistleblower herself. Kyla has a PhD in ecology from the University of Connecticut and a law degree from Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon. Her familiarity with science, the law, and the inner workings of state and federal governmental agencies enable her to assist public employees throughout New England. Welcome, Kyla. 
Thanks so much, Murr, and thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to come at this topic from a completely different angle, and I'm putting my ecology hat on. So I'm talking about the greenwashing associated with animal agriculture. Next slide, please, Claire. So in order to understand why animal agriculture is such an awful thing for the environment, we have to get a grasp a concept of how large and vast this agricultural system is. Every day in this world, we slaughter almost a million cows, 1.4 million goats, 1.7 million sheep, 3.8 million pigs, and then over 200 million chickens, hundreds of millions of fish. This is a lot of animals. Next slide, please. So how does all of this animal agriculture contribute to climate change? First of all, for the ruminant herbivores like cows, they have the four-chambered stomach. When they digest their food, they create methane, and this goes out into the atmosphere through burps and farts. And I know there's a lot of uh, jokes in literature about cow farts, but it's mostly from their burping, actually, about 90%. Manure also emits methane. The feed production for all these animals creates carbon dioxide and the land use changes of taking natural forests or grasslands or shrublands and converting them to pasture or factory farms is also um, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, finally, caring for and slaughtering the animals also emits a ton of greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. So how much and what type of foods actually uh, emit more? greenhouse gases. And this is a, um, a great little graph. And you can see on the left, we've got mostly at the top, um, the meats and dairies, beef, lamb, prawns, cheese, pig, poultry, eggs, um, milk is below rice, but everything else there is animal agriculture. If you look at the right hand side, so one kilogram of beef uh, emits about almost 100 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see on the left hand side of the chart that most of those plant based foods emit very, very little compared to the animal products. Next slide, please. Same thing with dairy. Dairy milk emits a lot more greenhouse gases than any of the plant milks. Next slide. So how much? We don't really know that's a problem. This is a graph showing all the different journal articles that have come out trying to estimate what that amount of greenhouse gases is associated with animal agriculture. And it ranges from a low of 11% up to almost 20. Uh, some scientists are thinking it's more like 30% of our greenhouse gases are associated with animal agriculture. Next slide. So what about the greenwashing? There's a ton of it. Every time I turn around, I see something new. One of them was that if you feed cows seaweed, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Well, unfortunately, cows don't like seaweed, as you can see from their expression. Um, it upsets their digestive system, and because they don't like it, they don't eat as much, and then the cows weigh less at slaughter, requiring more cows, which kind of defeats the purpose. Next slide. Feeding cows lemongrass allegedly reduced greenhouse gases. So when this came out, at first industry claimed it reduced methane by 33%. And then when people tried to recreate that study, it went down to 3.6%. And when they tried to recreate that study again, it was unable to be reproduced. Next slide. Then they tried methane masks on cows. And this is a cow, you can see how pleased he or she is wearing this. Um, it allegedly traps half the methane and converts it to carbon dioxide. Still not great. Obviously, methane is worse, but carbon dioxide is not great. Unfortunately, these masks reduce milk production from dairy cows. Some cows are getting injured, and it makes them unable to groom each other, which is a really important social aspect of their lives. Next slide, please. Uh, locally sourced meat. I hear this one all the time. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Only 1% of greenhouse gases from beef is from the transportation. And yet 65% of Americans think that this is the solution to climate change by eating locally raised beef. And this is how industry is able to greenwash everything and settle that cognitive dissonance that people have in their minds. Next slide, please. A new one is that uh, biogenic carbon cycle means that methane is recycled back into the soil. I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but suffice it to say that the methane that comes out from cows and their burps and their farts, it reaches, it reaches the atmosphere. It doesn't get converted back into carbon dioxide for 10 years. And any amount of methane emitted from cows has an immediate negative impact on the climate. And one molecule of methane is more than 80 times more potent than one molecule of carbon dioxide. Next slide, please. 
grass-fed beef is supposed to be climate conscious. No, grass-fed cows actually emit more methane than grain-fed. And remember, methane is a worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. A transition to grass-fed cows would require 30% more cows, and we would need to create more pasture land, which also leads to climate change. So this is also not helpful. Next slide. But animal agriculture industry really changes the narrative. And here's an example, a, a horrific example. The draft 2023 IPCC report stated that plant-based diets can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 50%. It was taken out because of heavy lobbying from the dairy and meat industry. And the ultimate one said, the, the final report stated, we need a balanced, sustainable, healthy diets acknowledging nutritional needs. Nothing about plant-based diets or the harm associated with animal agriculture. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna stun some of you or piss some of you off, but solving climate change will not solve all of our problems. Climate change is a symptom of ecological overreach or overshoot. The human demand for nature natural things exceeds the regenerative capacity of our natural ecosystems. So human consumption is driving loss of biodiversity, climate change, extinction, pollution, water scarcity, and water pollution. And animal ag agriculture is a huge part of this overreach. Next slide, please. This is just a graph showing the land use of foods per 1,000 kilocalories. And you can see again that it's mostly meat and dairy on the left that's at the top of this. They take up way too much land to feed us. Next slide. And why is that important? This is a graphic. I put this on Twitter a couple of weeks ago and it got over two and a half million hits. Um, Earth's mammalian biomass, humans is 390 million tons and domesticated animals, 630 million tons. These are cows, goats, sheep, dogs, cats. Look at the tiny little green and blue areas on the left and the right. That's all that's left for wild animals. Next slide, please. So why does biodiversity matter? Dr. Paul Ehrlich, a very famous um, ecologist, came up with something called a rivet popper theory. If you're on an airplane and you look out the window and you see all those little rivets holding the wing on, and um, the, the airplane is like your ecosystem, and a rivet is a, a species of animal. When a rivet pops off, that means an extinct uh, one species has gone extinct. So you can sit there in the plane and go, oh, we lost a rivet. Oh, we lost another rivet. Hmm, how many rivets are there? There are thousands. We'll probably be okay. We'll probably be able to land. But the problem is that if one of those wing rivets, one of the rivets attaching the wing to the airplane starts popping off, that's really dangerous. And that's analogous to a keystone species like a wolf pictured here. There are certain species, and we don't know what they all are, but we do know some of them, krill, beaver, wolf, Keystone species, if we eliminate these keystone species, it could lead to the collapse of the entire ecosystem and humans are part of that ecosystem. Next slide, please. So what can we do? Um, not a lot, except still fight. Try to go plant-based, try to give up that meat and dairy. It, it really isn't hard, it's healthier for you. It's healthier for the planet. It's much more humane for the animals. In the UK, 650 academics urged UK universities to go plant-based. If you're a student, you should urge your uh, college or university to do the same. But we have to really start thinking more than just solar, green energy versus fossil fuel energy. We need to think about the earth as a whole system and we need to stop with the ecological overshoot. We need to reduce our consumption as a whole. Thank you very much, happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Kyla. That was very eye-opening as usual. And I'm definitely reconsidering my dietary choices as we speak. So we have um, a couple questions for Kyla and then we have uh, plenty of time for Q&A. So we're gonna get um, back, to bring back the panel and then we'll get to some more questions before the end of the webinar. All right, so question for you, Kyla. Uh, from Larissa. Are emissions from animal milk production worse than water required to produce plant milks? So yes, when those graphs take into account the amount of water use, and I know that there's a lot of um, talk about almond milk using a lot of water, there is obviously greenhouse gas emissions associated with water use because you have to pump water and that takes electricity most of the time unless you have a windmill. Um, so, but those graphs do take it into account. So overall, 
the greenhouse gas emissions associated with cow milk is much higher than any of the plant milk, even almond milk. All right, next question from Megan before we get into our uh, live Q&A for everyone. I always hear the argument that cows need to be milked. What would you say to that statement? Do you think it's false? Cows need to be milked if they have had a baby. So many people, it's shocking to me that so many people think that cows just like produce milk. They don't produce milk unless they have given birth. It's not like chicken eggs. Chickens will lay eggs whether they are pregnant or not, whether those eggs are fertilized or not. Cows will not produce milk unless they're pregnant. If we stop impregnated them, we won't have to milk them. So that's the bottom line for that question. Excellent. Thanks so much. Can we go to our next slide? Thanks. All right, so thank you to our panelists for sharing your insights on greenwashing and false climate solutions. I learned so much about the pitfalls of renewable energy credits and carbon offsets and the climate and public health impacts of trash incinerators and animal agriculture. With 2023 being the hottest year on record, we're already seeing devastating impacts of climate change and pushing up against the threshold of 1.5 degrees warming. In the coming decade, we need to dramatically scale up renewable energy, protect intact ecosystems, and decarbonize our lives. Supporting strong climate policies and making more climate-friendly choices are some of the most important ways we can reach these goals. But to be effective, we need to know the truth about which mechanisms actually work and the real climate impacts of renewable energy sources and our food systems. I hope you provided some valuable information today and that you feel inspired to take action and learn more. So now I'd like to um, take down the slides and invite our panelists to turn their cameras on, open up the floor for our live Q&A. Um, so again, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions and click upvote if you're interested in hearing a response to a question that has been submitted. Great, so thank you all so much. We've gotten lots and lots of really great questions. And I'm gonna go back to some of the questions that were submitted during the individual presentations because they're definitely um, very good to address. So this question is from Sonia. She said, thank you for these eye-opening presentations. So while the Maryland Climate Plan advocates for removing w WTE, Unfortunately, it still hails biomass and biogas as renewable, as does the administration. How do we address this issue? In Maryland, how do, how do we, the climate nonprofits, climate scientists, and public health specialists get into the committee mentioned in the plan that will define what is clean energy for both the RPS and outside? And Tim and Sanai um, could probably weigh in on this, but all the panelists are welcome to answer. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll jump in first and then pass it to Sanai. Uh, great question, uh, Sonia. I think the biomass industry, which is part of the pulp and paper and forestry industry, is exerting its muscle throughout the country um, and internationally to make sure the burning of wood, whether it's wood pellets or wood waste, um, is considered renewable. And there is a lot of money going into those programs through uh, grants from the federal government, and there's a lot of lobbying at the state level. So um, it requires a movement of people to challenge um, our legislators at every step, not only in the laws they design, but when they um, when they try and build these facilities. So it requires a fracking type of mass movement from people. Yeah, I agree with Tim. I think... Um, I'm also figuring out what does that committee look like? Who will be represented? How do we ensure that people are on it? People who need to be listened to? Um, and I think that unfortunately the plan was a bit vague in, in, how, in how it foresees this uh, the standard as to what is considered clean and renewable. And I think it goes back to, and then another question about, you know, how do we talk about what is clean and what is renewable? How do we talk about the energy systems that we have in a way that's not simplifying or in a way greenwashing? Uh, but 
going back to Tim, I think the, the key is presence, um, educating and mobilizing people to, to, to share their opinions and why they care. Um, I'm, I've always been told power is organized people and organized money. And if you can't have the money, try and organize the people uh, to be able to say what needs to be said. Um, and of course, if, if we have access to that, that space, you know, our goal is to essentially pass a microphone or megaphone to uh, folks in the community to, to dictate what they want to see, because at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, this is passed on through, you know, utility bills. This is something that we're all paying for. We ought to have a say in, in what we support. Thanks so much. I totally agree with that. And I think it's just kind of wrong to say that burning trash is renewable electricity and that it should be included in the RPS for sure. So another question that's along those lines, and this is for Tim, but anyone can, can also answer. So your slide mentioned the goal of 50% electricity to come from renewable sources in Maryland by 2030. And will you talk about how this is greenwashing? I coordinate with lots of people with the Maryland Citizens Climate Lobby and Chesapeake Climate Action Network, a nonprofit working in Maryland. So Maryland's specific program is greenwashing for a couple reasons, not all of it, but parts of it, and it's costing consumers lots of money. One is, as we mentioned, it subsidizes the burning of waste to energy as well as biomass. So it's subsidizing dirty energy sources that don't help with the climate. And number two, it's uh, subsidizing a lot of old wind farms and hydro farms in the South and Midwest that don't need funding, that aren't producing any additionality or new clean energy. So Maryland is one of the more problematic RPSs, in my opinion, in the country. Great, thank you, Tim. I'm very glad to hear that here and these groups are working together um, for change in Maryland's renewable standards. Okay, so this next question, I think maybe Lori, I'll have you answer it first, but then all, any of the panelists can, can weigh in after. This is a question from Larissa. So when do you think the narrative will shift from human-caused change to industry caused climate change, or if it will? That's an interesting question. Um, obviously, I've highlighted industrial sources of uh, greenhouse gases, but the truth is, I don't think it's bad to think of it as human caused, because I think we are all contributing, and it, I think it's fine to accept that, and, and at the same time, to try and accept responsibility which I think everybody who's joined today feels to be part of the solution, to be part of organizations, to be part of coalitions where we actually put enough pressure on our legislators to enact helpful legislation. I know Citizens Climate Lobby is doing that. We have, you know, Food and Water Watch is part of an alliance against offsets with over 100 uh, organizations, some of them very small. And so, yeah, I encourage people to be in touch about these questions if I can be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that question? I'd like to just add something. I mean, I think there's a real effort on the part of industry and governments to shift it to shift the burden of climate change to the individual. You know, so if if you don't if you don't use plastic straws or if you recycle or if you buy an electric vehicle um you can make things better um and i i think there's a danger in that because it does take the responsibility away from the industries and our governments but i agree with lori that it's really all of us and you have to keep in mind that individuals can force change on governments or industry if we if there's if we stop the demand for certain products they will not be made anymore it would take enough of us to do it but just recycling and buying an ev isn't going to cut it we have to do more than that but if we all work together we can change that supply and demand and can make a change great thanks kyla that perspective. 
Um, we have another question here from Jim and Kyla, if you want to answer this one first and then we can get input from the other panelists. So Jim asks, given the several other planetary boundaries that we've exceeded, all of which are largely due to basic economic goals of infinite consumption growth on a finite planet, aka the ideology of the cancer cell, isn't this program's hyper-focus on just climate a type of greenwashing? Absolutely. I hope that, <laughs> I hope that, I mean, let me back up. We're not trying to greenwash, but I think the addition of my talk at the end hopefully address that. Yes, we've exceeded planetary boundaries, so many of them. Chemical pollution is one. All of that, all of the boundaries that we have exceeded because of this growth for the sake of growth ideology, which um, is the, the ideology of a cancer cell, um, that has to stop. And I would strongly recommend that everybody on this call Google um, Dr. William Reese, R-E-E-S. He is the one who coined the term ecological overshoot or overreach. And he has a bunch of great videos. Some of them are quite long, but there's one seven minute one out there. I put it in my list of references, but you can certainly find it. But they're all so interrelated. Our loss of biodiversity, our loss of wild lands, our, our pollution, our water scarcity and pollution um, and climate change is all because of ecological overreach. And they're so interrelated, it's impossible to tease them apart. Myla. So we have another question about false solutions. And um, if any of the panelists are familiar with this, you can give your answer. So Sue asked, where does biochar energy production fall on the scale? Uh, yeah, well, for me, um, I just was fighting a biochar product pro project in Massachusetts. Um, there are a couple of problems with biochar. First of all, uh, creating it is energy intensive. And second of all, there's a lot of studies now that are showing that it's damaging to soil. Um, so, you know, there's, there's so many of these solutions that haven't been thought through or haven't been um, tested outside of the lab and scaled up to the, to the size of solutions that we need. Biochar also, um, a lot of the problem there is there are, is emission of a lot of pollutions in the creation of biochar. Um, so that can be a problem as well, particularly for EJ communities, which are inevitably in the areas where the factory is, so or the facility is. So um, I think it needs to be looked at very closely, but I'm happy to have someone else weigh in and not. I'll weigh in briefly. I second everything Kyla said. Um, Biochar is often uh, portrayed as low-hanging fruit, but it's one of those things that can never really be scaled up and even on a small scale can create unintended consequences and a lot of pollution and a lot of demand for forced um, to be used for the biochar. Okay, great. Thanks, Tim. So we're going to move on to uh, a kind of a complicated question, but it's about methane. And this one was upvoted. This is from Chandu. So the fossil fuel industry has gotten away with major with a major greenwashing trick. Over a 20 year period, one ton of methane causes as much warming as 81 tons of CO2. But we've been we've been convinced to use an index of 27 instead of 81 because the badness of methane is 27 times that of CO2 if measured over a 100 year period. However, the critical period for climate tipping points is the next 20 years, and all studies, calculations, reports, papers, and policies should be using that 20 year global warming potential or GWP index for methane. If we did this, we would understand the true harm of methane and agriculture and natural gas sectors will feel the pressure. Do you agree? Pure agrees. One hundred percent. Yep, we we've we've been involved in this issue, and uh, the, the the science behind it um, is well known. Um, and uh, we're using the wrong global warming potential and time span for methane. Great, great, thank you. 
Okay, so another question about the livestock industry from Val. How do we as nonprofits and individuals combat the influence the livestock industry has on lawmakers, especially with the deep pockets the livestock industry has? Also, are you concerned that the new rule that BLM is considering, BLM is Bureau of Land Management, to include conservation as a use, as a land use, and the livestock industry attempting to claim grazing provides any level of conservation through restoration of damaged lands. That's a it's that's the sixty four thousand dollar question, isn't it? How do we get um, people to care about this and to actually do something about it? Um, there are some federal legislators who care about this issue. Cory Booker is one. Um, he's vegan. He cares deeply about the effects of animal agriculture. Um, there's another rep whose name escapes me right now, who's very um, invested in this as well. So I think it's a matter right now of educating people, but I would love to see the um, subsidies, the federal subsidies for dairy and milk get taken away. Because if we understood the true cost of these products, there would be a lot less use of them. Um, and as far as uh, the great the people who graze their cows on BLM lands saying that that's good for the land, it's absolute fiction. It is not good for the land. And Pierre actually has a um, great uh, map on our website uh, that shows the impacts of grazing on BLM lands. And you should definitely take a look at it. Tim can probably address it more uh, in more detail than I can. Yes, so um, what Kyle is talking about is uh, Pierce spent many years uh, gathering the land health data from the Bureau of Land Management and putting it in a, in a map, an interactive map on our website, which we're about to update. And um, the, the causes for land health failures in the West, particularly in the upper elevation arid West, are overwhelmingly from cattle grazing. And so that's from the government's own documentation. And uh, to say, therefore, that uh, grazing is a conservation use is a complete fiction. I think it just shows the power of the lobby. Thank you. All right. So next question that was uploaded as well is from Kai. So until and unless the elite class, those in positions of power, in the donor class that's behind them, who are mandating society-wide change, drastically curtail their own carbon-intensive behaviors, I won't believe a word they say. For instance, how many green groups first and foremost advocate for the end of US imperialism, war, and sanctions, et cetera? So what do the panelists think about that and about the kind of unequal carbon footprint that um, some individuals have? <laughs> Yeah, I can say a little bit about that. Um, I, I mean, I agree. I think the um, there are multiple ways in which we can address that issue. But I think when it comes time to, for my work, you know, when we do a lot of bringing regular people to halls of government, um, I think the 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 best way in which you can disrupt that is being present and also being a disruptor. Um, I think that whenever we meet with a lot of these elected officials, we also don't believe a word that what they say, but we we share our message and we are present and we try to hold them accountable to do what we want them to do. Um, and I agree with Sonia, we gotta take money out of politics, but until that's out, we're gonna have to be the, the people who keep accountability and show that we're paying attention. Many of them don't think that we're paying attention, uh, but saying that we pay attention, that we understand what's going on, uh, is, is really a start to begin to push uh, back against the norm of having elected officials who are not trustworthy and are not doing the right thing. So just continuously applying a pressure and accountabilities, the ways that in which we've been able to address the, the issue of, you know, these corrupt politicians, you know, because at the end of the day, we're not expecting them to save us from, 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 this situation. They don't have any ability to, but we have to fight to get them to, you know, to help us be able to save us. Um, thanks, Sanai. So uh, we're getting 
close to the end of our time here. So I'm going to ask one more question. And if the panelists want to give kind of just a two second answer, and then we'll get into concluding remarks. But I think I'd like to end with this question because I think it's something that we all are potentially wondering about. So this is from Ben. How do you reduce overall consumption with an exponentially growing global population? Well, <laughs> um, I don't think we're gonna be exponentially um, expanding for much longer. We're gonna hit our limit. Um, already you're seeing impacts from pollution, reducing fertility in men and women, but especially in sperm. Um, but you're right, we, we, we're, we're going to crash. You know, the one thing that people forget is that humans are animals and as animals, we are subject to the biological and evolutionary processes that every other animal is. Um, but, but we just, it's going to have to be mandated, I'm afraid, because people aren't going to do it on their own. Um, you know, when I need a new sweater, the first place I go is my local thrift store to see if I can find something before I buy something new. Um, most people don't do that. Um, some people are more privileged. My house is solar. I'm privileged. But again, not everybody can be solar because we'd the mining associated with what we need for the batteries is is going to destroy the earth. So there's no easy answer to that question, I don't think. That wasn't two seconds. Sorry, Mer, but there's just not an easy answer to that question. Yeah, I think you're right. There's no easy answer. But I think that as we're building awareness, we are aware and we're looking for solutions and definitely looking for companies to also take the lead in creating products that are more sustainable for sure. All right. So uh, in the interest of time, we're going to have to wrap it up here. So we have some parting information to share if we could just pull up our last slide. All right, so thank you so much for, to our audience and to our panelists for attending today's webinar and for the partnership of Bard College's Worldwide Climate and Justice Education Week. We will be sending participants a follow-up email with the webinar recording, as well as several resources recommended by our panelists and our contact information. If we did not have a chance to respond to your question today, please feel free to reach out to me or the panelists via email. You can visit our website at peer.org to learn more about Peer's climate integrity work. Thanks everyone and have a great day. <laughs>